Really, so the cut over itself, because these things, as, as everyone in this room knows, it, it's very difficult uh, when you're doing a massive cut over, especially when you have you know millions and millions of members, and then especially when there's a bunch of uh, legacy systems that were in play. And we did a complete rewrite of our stack, essentially. Um, so it was the front ends that were changing, the orchestration layer, um, our uh, data um, uh, capabilities, um, our uh, loyalty banking software. I mean, really everything was uh, swapped out as a result of the change. So we were really happy, obviously, to see a smooth cutover. But it was uh, during a very difficult period. We actually launched uh, early November last year, relaunched early November last year. Um, and Canada had some of the strictest lockdowns, um, uh, certainly the strictest in, in this hemisphere, um, and for a very long time. And so travel demand was very depressed. Uh, heck, you know, uh, restaurants were closed, um, you know, for I think seven, eight months pretty much, you know, uh, in a row. Um, and that obviously affected. Uh, you know, interaction with the program, volumes on the program, et cetera. Um, I don't know, I might defer to the team if that's okay for each person's, um, you know, best and worst of the relaunch. I certainly have mine, but then or maybe we go around the room here. Pick me. <laughs> uh, so when we launched the, the program in, uh, in November of 2020, uh, one thing that we said, you might've heard us say over and over again is, you know, what you're what you're seeing us launch uh, right now represents you know about 60 percent of what we have in mind for the transformed aero plan and that left us with a lot to still launch uh, in, in 2021 uh, and so you know the thing that I'm probably most proud of is you know despite the the backdrop that you know that mark just described basically with even our you know some of our most active members still sitting quite a bit in hibernation or at least travel hibernation as as it uh, pertained, uh, uh, we still press forward with you know with our development plans. We introduced uh, status pass uh, early in the year, uh, an industry first. The ability to basically make somebody, uh, for, the ability for one of our top tier elites to make anybody an elite for a day, uh, and to give them basically the Midas touch on their reservation and everyone traveling in that same reservation, an industry first. That launched. Uh, we launched uh, some meaningful new retail partnerships back in our home market, which you know, could not have been more appropriately timed when you think about it. When folks aren't traveling, how does a travel loyalty program gain everyday relevance? And so uh, new partnerships with Starbucks, uh, with, uh, with more recently Uber Eats and uh, the LCBO, for those of you not familiar with uh, Canada or Ontario, LCBO is basically uh, that is uh, that that is the liquor uh, board of Ontario. It is the only way to buy booze in Ontario, uh, and the world's largest world's largest purchaser uh, of of alcohol. And so, uh, this is uh, again just adding to the everyday context, the everyday partnerships. Really, just kind of as a sum nation, uh, another uh, proud add to the program. And then Air Partners. Uh, you know, uh, we, we never stopped our conquest to add more partners, uh, more air partners into, uh, into the program. That was a big ad for us, very excited about that. Um, uh, and we, I think we just teased a new air partner just yesterday, uh, uh, Oman Air. And the thing about Oman Air, like this is, uh, for those of you that might not, might not be familiar with it or might not uh, uh, you know, know why Oman Air would be such an exciting ad to our program, it's when you think about aspirational travel and the ability to uh, go shopping for awards, the addition of an, of an airline's network like Oman Air means dramatically more uh, reward search uh, uh, results uh, because now you have the connectivity of Oman's network along with 44 other airline partners to, to generate results uh, for our members, getting them to where they want to go and in the cabin that they want to go. And so let those be just a few examples. Just, oh, I guess just a few hours ago, uh, this is a good one. Uh, you can see our matching get up here. Uh, uh, we uh, just a few hours ago launched uh, or relaunched, I should say, uh, our U.S. co-brand credit card. Uh, so with uh, with Chase, uh, with J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, uh, we launched our, our co-brand at eight o'clock this morning. So again, just great examples of of how we're you know uh, striving to deliver uh, against that remaining forty percent uh, that we promised, and we're still going from there and having the team not be uh, not be distracted. 
Um, I, I yeah, actually maybe I'll pick up on that on that piece specifically. I think the fact that we have maintained diligence on what we are doing and what we are not doing, because we came through a very difficult period last year, we figured out how to go through the relaunch virtually. Um, with actually a number of partners who are sitting here in the room today, so thank you for the collaboration. Um, Is your mic on? I think so. Is it? Do I need to? No. Oh. Take this one. Okay. Is this better? We have that. Oh God. Okay. There we go. Okay. So a uh, great round two. I can start over. Um, I, I will say I, I think one thing that was most impressive to me is how we figured out how to get all of our work done um, virtually last year and collaborating with a lot of the vendors who are sitting in the room today. So so thank you for that. And I think to pick up on Scott's point, the diligence around what work we are going to do, what work we aren't going to do. Um, you know, I was saying to Mark earlier and Scott earlier as well. Last year, literally, we were sitting in a room in Vancouver talking about what are the things that we need to get done this year and we've checked every box so the fact that we've maintained that diligence I think is a big part of our success um, I, I would say maybe one of the other things is Mark mentioned this earlier is we've seen over a million people enroll in Aeroplan over the course of the past year and I can tell you you know enrollments doubled um, you know they doubled to like 8,000 in the week past launch last year but the fact that we've seen that really steadily pick up um, in part because of things that we've done in our channels, but also just because of general member interest in the program once again. You know, I think we feel a, a good level of confidence about where the program is going just based on that, you know, interest in what we're doing uh, overall, not just from the, you know, the, the loyalty community and the airline industry, but, but from customers themselves. Well, I, I bring this, I guess, a bit of a legal spin to the question of the best and the worst. The best, of course, obviously, is the launch of the new program, but from a legal perspective, it was a bit of a nightmare <laughs> because you got to tear down or rebuild everything from the very beginning. And more than that, um, we, we did all of that process and then you're launching right into the face of a pandemic. And I think the learning that came from it is a couple of things. And, and one of the things I've enjoyed as a lawyer participating with this group is it's all about, yes, we can and how can we do it? And so the result has been the same thing with the partners. And I know when I talk to young people about what it is about loyalty, and we all start with that opening word, partnership. But, you know, for those of you that spend time on the legal agreements, we've all got our little pieces that we protect, depending on which side you're on. And I would have said the thing that was unbelievable about this process has been that on every side, when you bring to it a higher level of delivery to the core people that you're responsible for, your customers, it makes it easy to get to yes I can and we've ended up in launching into the face of that over and over again trying to over deliver which broke down the barriers with everybody having respective sides um, even in the face of the pandemic uh, and how do you engage them finding new ways to do it so I think the most amazing thing has been not only launching a whole new program but you've had to find a whole new way of doing it engagement etc which you guys can talk to but and then writing the agreements for all that so it's been real time all the way through, but very interesting. You know, um, thinking back to, you know, our, our previous conversations, you know, Mark, there are a couple of things that stood out to me uh, when I think back to some of our, our discussions last year. You know, one was, uh, I'm going to botch the line, but I thought it was great, you know, where you basically said, uh, you know, IT is where a lot of good ideas go to die. Um, and, and I think everybody in the room can relate, you know, when it comes to getting, you know, IT resources or really resources from any of your other departments, you know, whether it's marketing channel access, certainly IT resources, if you're in the airline space, revenue management corporation, you know, although I think that, you know, the winds have been changing uh, in, in regards to that a little bit. Um, there are a lot of other moving parts uh, in an airline, in a, in a, in a global alliance airline. Uh, it's not just as simple as, um, you know, a bunch of loyalty nerds getting together and going, hey, let's create our ideal, you know, Greenfield, you know, figure flyer program, which I understand is essentially what you guys did. But it's not as simple as that because you have to have buy-in from so many others. And it's great that Stephen's here as well to probably put a bit of a sobering context on some of that, as he's already sort of teased. Um, but ultimately, you know, I think that, I mean, everybody in the room struggles, and I think if we were to be open and frank, we would say when we think about executive leadership in our organizations, you know, we, there's a continuum of support, you know, from we only have a loyalty program because the other mob have a loyalty program, so we have to have a loyalty program, don't push it, you know, <laughs> be grateful you have a job, um, to loyalty is front and center, we are front, front running our brand with our loyalty program. You know, Bonvoy is a great, great example of that. Um, 
and you've got everything in between. Um, you guys had a, you know, I think everyone understands the story, but just for the sake of completeness, I mean, you guys had an interesting dynamic coming into this, you know, with Aeroplan bringing the program back in house after not only having it outsourced, you know, um, or spun off, but complete, you know, complete separation, which itself created friction for your own customers. So not only were you doing that, but you weren't just bringing it in house, but relaunching a brand new program. Um, and of course, in the context of the timing that we're in. How did you go, and I know we sort of touched on it in the very early discussions that we've had, but reflecting on it now 12 months or so later, how do you feel it's gone with regard to being able to work with all the other moving parts in the organization that need buy-in, um, you know, from the CEO down? Um, so, um, you know, it's interesting because uh, there's a lot of talk about diversity and unfortunately sometimes there's a lot of lip service paid to it, but there's a tremendous substance that it can offer. Um, and uh, between the team that, you know, we had the opportunity to build a team from scratch. Uh, when I arrived at Air Canada, there was, I think, nine people that were involved with loyalty at Air Canada. And so we hired and hired, and we ended up with a team of about 50 people, and then did the acquisition of uh, Aeroplan, and a team of 900 came along, of which kind of the core management components were about 200, 250 people. Um, and what we have in that team um, is in incredibly diverse sets of set of skills, experiences, and cultures. I mean, just on this uh, stage here, uh, background in legal, background in digital, background in uh, customer experience and communications, background in loyalty, um, as I've described kind of the core strengths of each of the four of us. Um, and then throughout the team, people that have worked at, we have over a dozen airlines represented, we have a half a dozen hotel chains, we have over a dozen banks in the UK, Australia, Canada, and the United States. Um, we actively speak 25 languages plus on the team. So when, for example, we wanna you know, do an air partner negotiation, we can uh, conduct it in the language of that partner, or at least with the knowledge of how things work in Bahrain versus how things work in Russia versus how things work in Mexico. Etc. Um, and that's really the strength of the team. And then you take that and you focus it internally. Um, we have leaders who have either worked in or done the discipline of all of the different counterparties and colleagues that we need to work with within Air Canada. And we kind of front that perspective. So for example, for me, I'm a recovering revenue management person. Um, and um, the, the difference that that makes in designing a redemption model and a transfer price mechanism, along with some of my other colleagues who have that experience and have done it at other carriers, that made all the difference in the world. Um, and you know, it's interesting, right? Um, sometimes you have to lose something to realize how much value it has, you know, and maybe we realize that in our personal relationships or whatever. Well, because Air Canada had lost, in effect, I mean, not lost, but spun out, but in a sense lost its loyalty program, um, and a number of our most senior leaders, our chief operating officer started his career, uh, or uh, worked for about half of his career in Aeroplan. Our chief commercial officer started her career as a call center agent at Aeroplan. So they got it. We lost it as an organization. We had no control. It was very difficult, and so when we brought it back, we really understood the value and all of the things, the ideas, the initiatives that we wanted to take on that we weren't able to do, um, you know, in the last uh, two decades or so, just under two decades. Um, so I, you know, in, to summarize diversity, um, especially skill sets, experience, backgrounds, languages on the team, and then number two, um, uh, a certain appreciation for the importance of the project and the program within the broader Air Canada organization as a result of having lost it. Anyone want to add to that or are you happy with Mark's? Uh, so and I think we touched on this the last time we all got together. It's, just, it's something that I'm particularly proud of is how uh, your loyalty doesn't sit as a silo within, within our organization. Uh, it's very much embedded in the overall commercial uh, organization. So we have, we, we feel like we share a constant uh, dialogue with our, with our colleagues in revenue management, for example, or in sales, or in literally any area of, uh, of, of our headquarters organization. Uh, you know, the legal branch. I mean, this is a, uh, we've stripped away a lot of the formality because we are in each, you know, we are talking with each other constantly, not multiple times a month. We're talking a week and in many cases uh, per 
per day. Uh, we are very much sitting in the conscious of the, uh, you know, of, of, of the broader organization, and that helps. And what we saw this year is uh, we started to do the same uh, with our largest partners. Think about our banks, uh, our new retail partners. Uh, you know, the, when you when you build these contracts, you always build in like a joint steering committee, a body that gets together once a quarter, and they seem to be very very well structured, but there's also not a lot of meat and potatoes in those conversations, uh, you know, quite quite honestly, at least. Boring QBRs. Yeah, exactly. Uh, news and sports. Uh, and we, we got rid of the formality and we got rid of the news and sports and we actually are on the, we're on calls with each other multiple times uh, a week, trying to, you know, really thinking together collaboratively about how we advance our business. Uh, we, have, you know, we have made their problems our problems, and they have uh, they just the same uh, feel the you know, they they are embracing our problems, and we're working uh, together in a way that we've never worked uh, before. So to see that level of of cooperation happening both within the organization and with our partners is the right setting, the right space uh, for us to actually innovate. Director, do you want to add, or are you? I'll say one thing very quickly. I, I often feel like my role is chief diplomat for Aeroplan, um, speaking and being engaged with other parts of the organization. And I, I think one comment that Mark just made, and, and Scott kind of picked up on it too, is bringing the perspective of other experiences that you've had within the airline. Like for instance, I have the joy of both being on the hook for Air Canada gross billings, but also managing the cost of Air Canada points issued. So having to kind of think with both sides and deliver value for both sides, but thinking more about the enterprise economic value for Air Canada, um, I, I think that's a game changer. And I, I think that, you know, hopefully that's the direction more programs will go in because I, I do think customers win when that happens. And uh, uh, Stephen, from your perspective? Well, I, just, I listened to uh, Derek and I sat an earlier session just before lunch. There was a brief comment mm -hmm. recognizing the importance of the connection between Aeroplan and the airline. And all of you have said it. I look at this at the end of the day in answer to your question. Air, aeroplan and the concept of where the airline sits will be so embedded. I mean, I watch what they do in terms of the loyalty program, and it's just oil that's going to grease the machine throughout the airline. And the focus of loyalty is, especially as travel comes back, is essential. So I, the answer to your question is from the CEO down, people get it. And it's going to make it, I sound like a uh, commercial, but it makes it successful. So the person's comment this morning, believe me, uh, I see it day to day. They get how important in front center. So we're all amongst friends here and, you know, we're, we're, we're a, candid, a candid bunch of fellas. Um, you know, and uh, as you guys have self-described, you know, uh, the fun of this whole project for you guys was that the lunatics got to take over the asylum. And, you know, and I think that the, the rest of us in the industry has as much fun with that as you guys, you know, actually, you know, Pouring gasoline on the fire did. It was um, inmates, by the way. What's that? We are not lunatics. <laughs> inmates, I'm sorry. Inmates, inmates, yes. Um, well, you know, let's talk about some lunatics then. So, Mark, you you didn't hold back this morning, you know, with regard to US airline programs. And, um, you know, uh, they're our friends and they're usually here. And um, I, know, I know that Luke at United was particularly disappointed that he wasn't able to solve a conflict to, to, to be here today. So, But, however, this is how it works in most things in life. If you're not in the room, we pick on you. So uh, that's just, that's just how it is. Um, but no, but let's, let's be serious here. You made the comment this morning, and I know that this was really at the forefront of your thinking when you designed the new Aeroplan program, you know, and you looked for opportunities to add value, you know, to add relevance uh, to a broader section of the customer base, you know, all those themes that we've been talking about. And, and you know, you made the point quite pointedly, you know, US, you know, US airlines have potentially gone too far with regard to devaluations and, and there, is, there is risk. It, this isn't just whining and moaning that I didn't get my upgrade. This is, there is real risk to the commercial model and the commercial success and the, the economics of the overall airline. Uh, from this, you know, we touched on the examples uh, this morning. I, I made a comment about United co-brand revenue and American co-brand revenue with changes they made over the years. Um, but we've seen a huge, uh, a huge shift in the thinking when it comes to U.S. airlines because of the securitization of the loyalty programs in the last 18 months. You know, the pandemic has has laid bare. You know, um, and honestly, all of a sudden we have disclosures from airlines that a few years ago folks like Joan Adani and myself would never have dreamed of actually getting them to finally open up about. Um, there is still a difference, though, between 
those loyalty program managers, frequent flyer program managers that have the right executive sponsorship of leadership that gets the role that the loyalty program should play to maximize the win across the entire organization for everybody. You know, having loyalty as a goal in the pocket of everybody can make every department win. And, and then we see others that refer to the loyalty program simply as the card program, mm -hmm. you know, um, and they still, they still don't get it, uh, I think is a charitable way of, of, of saying it. But the, the point that you raised this morning, Mark, you know, very specifically you said they run, the devaluations run the risk of essentially killing the golden goose, or at least hurt, you know, slowing the golden goose down, if I can, if I can insert my own <laughs> language in there. Today, you've launched or relaunched your, your co-brand, your new co-brand product with, uh, with Chase. Um, obviously, the economics of co-brand and other gross billings was a huge factor in Aeroplan coming back in house, the launch of the new program. You know, I, the program is not just about the co-brand with Aeroplan, which is, I think, what makes it so special. But I, but let's not say that it was a small component. It was obviously a major point. How has all of that influenced your thinking in both designing the program, but also now twelve months on that you're sort of seeing customer reaction to it in terms of hey. We can't have everything. There are economic realities here, but we want to try to find that sweet spot of value for the member, but yet, you know, controlling costs and economic, you know, success for the parent brand. Sure. So, I mean, and for the record, um, uh, we are uh, business people, and we want to make money, and we want to make as much of it as possible. Period. End of story. Um, it's just. The, we see the, the the best, most sustainable way of doing that. We don't want to just make money for a quarter or for a year. We want to make as much money as possible, as long as possible. And so it's the difference between unit profitability versus overall profitability. And when we go to design a program, well, we know the drivers that we want. We want more engagement. We want more trial. We want um, uh, more frequency. We want more depth, all of those things. And those will lead to the best financial outcomes. So the question then becomes, what's the key uh, value drivers that need to be delivered in order to get that? And you know, uh, when, we, when we got our hands around Aeroplan, it was so interesting. It was you know, downright out of Dickens. Um, there were parts of it that were just amazing and so well run and so thought out in terms of the muscles that had been built as it was a separate company and that's all they were focusing on. And so like something I'd call out, we have a team that uh, essentially is the revenue management of redemptions. We call them currency management or redemption optimization. And I mean, I've you know, had the ability to have a, you know, a peer into a bunch of the major hotel and airline companies. I think that we've got the strongest in the industry. I really do in that regard. But then there were other elements of the program um, that you know, from our perspective, we're quite far behind, whether it's certain policy decisions or uh, value drivers or program operations, et cetera. Um, and so we said, well, you know, we want to grow the program, um, you know, both in terms of depth and breadth. How are we going to do that? Um, so just this is one simple example. Um, uh, AMIA was obsessed with breakage, 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 breakage. It was one of the number one things they tracked, they measured, they managed to because of the effect it had on their financial statements. And when we took over the program, um, they were running at uh, just under 13% as the breakage rate. And um, we designed a program um, to come bring it in around 8%, so call it a 50% reduction in breakage, which from a CFO perspective could be a very scary thing. Um, but you know, we determined and we had enough evidence that um, the ways in which we were gonna bring breakage down would more than make up for it in terms of membership growth and in terms of engagement, particularly in the infrequent traveler space, which is really where uh, we fight the competitive battle of in Canada with the other airlines. Um, and you know, so, so that's an example. And so yeah, we might take a, a unit hit to profitability, but if we're generating a lot more volume, it more than makes up for it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think we, 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 uh, we, we haven't hidden this fact. We are, uh, we're willing to increase our dividend uh, back to our, our members uh, if it means that we're able to grow the overall size uh, of the pie. Uh, and that's really uh, what, we've, what we've been focused on. So it, I mean, there's know, a sweet spot, isn't there? I mean, you know, if you're over generous, then your costs, uh, you know, your, your costs grow at a rate that doesn't line up with uh, higher engagement or higher enrollment or whatever metric you're trying to drive. 
Um, at the same time, though, to Mark's comment this morning, is you go the other direction, you really risk attractiveness of the program value proposition in its entirety, right? That's right. So, uh, you know, I, I think Mark used an example this morning. Uh, you think about the new generation of our of our uh, retail partnerships. Uh, so, uh, you know, in the coming weeks, uh, for example, we're going to introduce a new partnership uh, in Canada with with Uber and Uber Eats, and our members are going to be able to link their Aeroplan account to their Uber account. Uh, but that's not a one dimensional partnership. Uh, they're not just going to buy points from us and that's what you're going to be able to do. There are at least three dimensions of that partnership. There's something in there for our best customers. There's something in there for our uh, for all of our Aeroplan co-brand card holders. Uh, there's going to be a redemption component. Uh, and so there's multiple dimensions to that. But the basis of that relationship relied on actually having this to be a very affordable partnership from an Uber perspective. Uh, it had to be, you know, it, it, it definitely, you, you had to create a low hurdle for their business case. And just the same, we had to look at this and be convinced that it was at a minimum sustainable. There was not any element of this partnership that was going to be a money loser for us, but it wasn't also going to be wildly profitable. But the dividends of that Uber partnership, especially when put against the context of everything else that we're building alongside that, uh, there's a multiplier effect in the ecosystem. It makes Aeroplan as a program more attractive, it drives more engagement. And anytime you can get more engagement, more redemption opportunities, you actually start to see really productive behaviors out of your members. Maybe if I get just one more thing. To... Yeah, the other thing is, right, like we can make course corrections or we can change. I mean, a, a core part of our DNA, let's say, is inspired by, you know, the digital notion of test and learn. And we are doing that and we will do that with uh, the program, with its design, with partnerships, et cetera. And so there's going to be a bunch of things we'll realize we haven't gotten right. There's some things we've already realized we haven't gotten right. And we'll stop them, start them, change them, whatever we need to do. You know, so just you know, pivoting slightly on that, you know, and again, trying to keep with sort of the theme of some of the, uh, the themes that have come up today and, and a couple of weeks ago in London. You know, a, a big topic of conversation has been the mix of cut the customer base over the last 18 months and how it's different to what it looked like, you know, before, before March last year. Um, how, now that you've had the program, you know, up and running for a little while now, you guys were fully well aware of that as you went into the launch. Um, how has kind of the first 12 months, you know, borne out in terms of, well, what's it look like? And then the second part of the question is, is did it turn out the way you were expecting it to do, you know, immediately before launch? I, I, oh, this is on. Great. Okay, just checking. I heard it rustling. Um, I, I've said a couple of times at a few conferences I've been at, we, uh, we were lucky because we designed this program really with the infrequent traveler in mind. Um, we love to talk about the woman with the fish and the concept behind the woman with the fish was we had our frequent traveler, we had someone who never travels, and we had this, this woman holding a fish who travels a couple of times a year. And salmon fishing in BC is a leisure activity. Yeah, there you go. Very, He's holding a big salmon. Very Canadian, very Canadian. Um, and so I mentioned it just because that's kind of our rallying cry internally. And the, the, the thinking was really that Air Canada and Aeroplan, again, because of the separation, we underserved these customers. The, the credit card products that Aeroplan had, you know, didn't meet the needs of that customer. Air Canada was very focused on its frequent flyers. So there was this huge opportunity that quite candidly our competitors were taking great advantage of. So I would say with a lot of the features of the new program that we brought to bear, whether it's, you know, family sharing, the sharing of benefits, um, including on the credit cards, I, I think we've been able to activate on those uh, in a much more relevant way, given the types of consumers that we're seeing on Air Canada flights right now. So it's, I, I want to say it was almost a fortuitous result of what happened with the pandemic was the way that we designed the program and, and kind of how it's played out for us. Yeah, maybe I, the, the one thing I'd add to that, uh, you know, certainly when we set out to design the new airplane and as we were going through a lot of research, what we heard by and large from our elite population is please don't change it. Uh, like it, it works really well. Uh, and so we are kind of internally, all, we're always kind of vectoring to a, you know, uh, you know a 15% course correction more so than a clean sheet redesign of the elite program. But the question was, how do you broaden the appeal for everyone else? And then add on to that, uh, how do you actually make the status within, uh, within Aeroplan more accessible? And so uh, hopefully what you've seen are more on-ramps uh, to, uh, you know, to some ones 
their long haul fleets, et cetera. And that, you know, that, that opportunity is, is very strong. We are, um, I can't talk about where bookings are on a forward basis, but suffice it to say that market opportunity is very clear to us. You know, Mark, you, you uh, used an example earlier, uh, you know, about how uh, in many respects, uh, Aeroplan has not earned its natural share of, uh, of customers sitting on the aircraft. Uh, and I'd say in the U.S. context, uh, Aeroplan has not earned its natural share of membership here in the United States. Air Canada has not earned its natural share uh, of, of traffic uh, in the U.S. either. And we do believe uh, that, you know, uh, certainly, making a bull or, or creating a value proposition that's very appealing from American context and backing that up with a co-brand credit card offering that amplifies that offering is certainly uh, you know, some of the tactics uh, that you're going to see us taking here in the U.S. As Stephen, from your, uh, from your perspective, um, you know, we sort of covered a couple of questions there and skipped over you, but if I could kind of put them both together, um, preconceptions that you may have had in terms of Air Canada's natural aeroplanes, natural customer base, you know, considering what we've just talked about, the previous question about infrequent flyers or less frequent engaged members, and now specifically the US membership, from your perspective, uh, any insights on that? I guess my observation, uh, Air Can so we've got Air Canada there, but I think Aeroplan itself has transformed. The two key things that I saw that are themes that I've worked on, uh, we've had to document, one, and Scott referred to it, is uh, the customer interacting with us on one front, which we're used to, but where can we touch them in another way? Where can they get involved in the program in something else? And so one of the themes becomes, how many places can we do something that makes them think of us? And that transformation in terms of the broader Air Canada brand, your question earlier, it isn't just a dollars and cents thing. It should pay dividends, you hope, going forward big time for the airline, but also for the customer base, etc. So the one theme that's very strongly there, how can we get them not just to view us as a, on the airline side, but everything else? This concept of linking with the partners has been very critical because, fair enough, a Starbucks is a good example. You Starbucks have your own program. We respect that. However, we share customer. What can we do for each other? And so the contracting even for that has been a big deal. The respecting of each other's space, but also realizing for mutual advantage. So I think that first one has been huge in terms of saying, one, how many places can we interact with our customer and with big other brands without totally going into space? And the, and the second big thing that I think that I've watched, and again it comes down to, it's carrying the ball to our customers mm -hmm. and our partners. So if there's something we see, so for example, when you look at something like the uh, offering for Starbucks or what we're going to do with Uber, not only is there contracting between us and Uber, but we carry that ball to our bank partners. And so if you're a holder of the Aeroplan credit card, there are special deals for you there as well. So I would have argued that what's going on is legal documents aside, um, and I'm not saying we have a bigger view of it, but I think relative to what, you know, I. Fair enough, again, I come at it from a legal perspective. If you recognize the importance of multiple interactions, carrying the ball to your customer, these have been phenomenally good things for our bank partners, everyone that holds a bank card. I mean, the whole thing just, that to me is the biggest thing I've seen. And I've not seen that, at least in the Canadian market before, where there's this massive interaction. And I would say, yes, we carry the ball. And we take it there, and it's well, well received. So thinking, one step ahead, or one step further on the U.S. Uh, on the U.S. Um, potential U.S. customer side. Um, somebody else who's not in the room today, um, Mark Ross Smith, uh, StatusMatch.com. They're a sponsor, so I uh, acknowledge them, thank thank them for being a, a sponsor. Um, but hey, he's not here, so we get to pick on him. Um, that's that's the rules. That's how it goes. You guys did a partnership with them, um, a tripartite partnership with Destination Canada as well. Um, and um, I'm not going to say too much because I want to make sure I don't put my foot in and say the wrong thing. But um, do you want to talk about that a little bit in terms of from from your perspective? But it's interesting because to me, in the context of our discussion, there's two te big takeaways. Number one, the involvement of Destination Canada. I mean, that's unique. It, it's innovative. It's new. Uh, it's not simply a status match. 
Uh, the second thing being that the targeting of you know, US, um, uh, U- US frequent flyers uh, in the context of our previous, uh, previous couple of questions. And then the third thing I'll throw in there was in light of new developments um, and perhaps the inability of, uh, of folks who may have been wanting to um, complete the, the uh, behavioural requirements of that, of that challenge, uh, are, there, are you guys looking at any alterations or amendments given new developments? Alterations in terms of what we've like the deadline for completing the flight requirements, for example. No, not not at the moment. I I mean, what I will say is, I think we had a couple of objectives with that. First and foremost, I mean, what the guys are doing at Status Match is super interesting, and this was a, a really good opportunity for us to kind of see this space. I think we've run Status Match campaigns over the course of many years that have been to varying degrees of success. Um, but we really had a moment in time opportunity because we knew that we had the US card launching. So to be quite candid, I think we felt that it was a good you know, chance for us to make a little bit of noise in advance of the Chase partnership launching. Um, I, I guess the other thing I, I maybe say on the destination or the, the co-op marketing front, um, this is actually a place where we've been doing new things with Aeroplan over the course of time. So you, you may have seen what we've been doing, uh, obviously with the Status Match campaign, you're gonna be seeing us do a lot more things um, with bonus campaigns, bonus miles, other types of loyalty incentives. You know, quite candidly, this was something that with the Aeroplan separation, we just didn't have the right setup to be able to do. So it gives us, you know, a lot of new opportunities to play in different spaces with um, with our co-op cam- campaigns um, and create some interesting new engagement offers for customers. Um, i trying to think of anything else on the Status Match campaign. I. I Let's put it this way, I don't think we're going to be making any changes, but I think we are certainly going to be looking at the customers who chose to engage with us um, and see if there are further things that we want to do with them. Um, You know, I will say that uh, our our partner in the United States certainly had a bit of a reaction to the fact that we did that. Um, But, you know, as as Mark alluded to earlier, um, Aeroplan has not really been a strong competitor in the U.S. market. The U.S. market is big, and I think it is fair for us to go out and get our fair share. Um, so we're certainly going to be a little bit more aggressive, and I think you know this this partnership that we've just launched is uh, is a case in point in that. Uh, sorry, and just, just, and just to delve a little bit further into the involvement of Destination Canada, just perhaps for those that might not be familiar uh, with it, could we maybe throw a little more context, um, you know, sort of how you guys saw that you know, I guess how that working benefits of that with working. You know, I mean, it really was a in both large letters and small letters a destination Canada campaign, not strictly an aeroplane and aeroplane initiative. It, it, yes, you're right, and and you know, to be honest with you, we were comfortable with that both because it you know it gave us an opportunity to communicate in different channels than what we might usually have. But I'd, I'd also say it's it's also a little bit about bandwidth. Like, to be very honest with you, the conversation we were having was, we're not going to have the time or the capability to actually execute on this. Um, so for us, it was just a really good opportunity to be able to be out in front of a number of people without actually having to take on the marketing uh, work on our side. Mm-hmm. I won't get Mark in trouble by going, going with the next... I won't get the other Mark in trouble by putting Mark on the spot here with... Uh, what your first reaction was when uh, when it got pitched to you? So we'll love. Uh, yeah, no, we have a lot of time for Mark and his team. No, yeah, love respect for him and his team. No, look, I think, and I think, look, I think that the response uh, to the um, you know, to the initiative, I mean, it's incredibly innovative. Um, and uh, do you have any do you have any insight on how Destination Canada um, sort of has has viewed it in, in hindsight? I think they've seen it, just in terms of some of the emails that I've seen go back and forth, I think they've been very pleased by the take up, um, especially in you know travel media, travel blogs. Um, it, it is definitely going to be interesting once we run the post campaign analysis about the, the success of the campaign overall, but I would say just from a pure media perspective, they certainly feel like they got the value they were looking for. Yeah, and I think it would be, uh, I think it has to be a little bit of a grain of salt, you know, given transporter issues and things like that haven't quite been as been as optimistic as we would have thought a couple of months ago. So I think that you know, that's going to perhaps delay you know, some, some of the long-term insights on that. Just as we finish up, uh, if you guys are open to it, are there any questions uh, for the guys? Of course, there's going to be a couple. Uh, Nick, you had the microphone earlier. We'll come to you second. Um, so as you, as you think about technology, um, AI, machine learning, kind of how does that fit into your future plans? And more importantly, what what outcome do you want, you know, 
from, from engaging with your customers, for your teams to interact, and then for your brand. How does that um, play into your future plans? You want to start? <laughs> so, um, yeah, for, for my interest, quite candidly, first and foremost, is in customer servicing. Um, and customer experience, and there's a lot of things today that we are doing manually, um, or we're not doing um, to a, a level of um, accuracy that we could, um, where I think the applications exist. I mean, just to give you a very, very simple example right now. So Canada has that COVID vaccine mandate, right? And uh, while uh, all provinces in Canada issue an open health standard QR code, a lot of people downloaded their VAC certificates before, and we have a tremendous amount of American customers that have a CDC card that's handwritten. So the ability to automatically ingest and verify that information is an application right there where we are doing that, but we could be doing it better than we're doing it. And now you think about testing, there's no standard to how test results scripts come out. And so you need the ability to use ML to be able to do that. And that's a tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of different customer servicing and facilitation back office work so that, you know, for example, our uh, customer relations or our refunds department, we can get SLAs down to hours instead of weeks. Um, so that's my first interest. Um, we're already uh, using um, AIML to drive the majority of our digital marketing um, because we're running, uh, we're purchasing right now ads in um, about 20 countries um, for a lot of different product lines. Um, and um, we're increasingly using it uh, for uh, flight planning and day of departure on the operation side. Um, optimal routings for our aircraft across uh, you know, our system, um, fuel, weight and balance planning, uh, things of that nature. Nick? You, uh, you mentioned about, or well, several times you, you talked about stripping away formality, and uh, I, I get the fact that now it's all under the same roof, uh, the, the culture that you have, and you've got good alignment with other teams within uh, Air Canada, but how much or how far do you think you can go with that before you need a formal agreement on some of the stickier topics in the so for example inventory allocation for redemption or uh, we we purchase. just to be clear we never said that there wasn't a formal agreement to it <laughs> yeah, I, 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 it was really there there's a very very long formal set of formal agreements Understand how you work that because you do need a level of formality in there. And how, how have you how have you managed that so that you've maintained all of the benefits from having it under the same roof, but you need some sort of separation formality to, to keep things honest, right? So maybe I'll start. Uh, as as you heard us piping in, there there is formality. Uh, we had to start somewhere. Uh, but uh, you also heard Mark uh, allude to the idea of testing and learning. You know, these agreements that we came up with after we locked ourselves in a, in a Marriott Airport Hotel conference room for four days straight with our revenue man. Four days, two weeks. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I kind of blocked that out like a trauma <laughs> patient. But yeah, uh, so uh, we, we, no joke, uh, we really did lock ourselves in conference rooms and we ultimately did end up with a framework. But the framework was a hypothetical framework. Uh, and it really wasn't until uh, you know we actually had had uh, brought the program in house that we actually start uh, started to put that into into real practice. Uh, and some things we got right, and some things we didn't. Uh, and so, you know, part of that is the fact that we've actually resourced a team uh, that um, you know I would I would actually say that team uh, the both the loyalty team and the revenue management team have joint custody of this of this group. Uh, number one. Uh, number two. Uh, you know this. Um, you know, as as you think about revenue management analysts, and again, we're going to pick on revenue management as an example. I think that your question can be patterned across a number of different use cases around the organization, but we'll pick on the revenue management example. Uh, one thing that we realized early on was, uh, you, you know, the inventory allocation is the is is the, the stickiest of sticky points, uh, but. Uh, you know, we, we believed that creating the right set of measures and the right set of reporting uh, was going to be the number one uh, most important first step. Because okay? you know, as someone who's actually managing a, a particular region, a particular set of flights, 
you know, you don't necessarily want to, uh, you, you want to be careful. You want to make sure that you've got inventory there for higher yielding folks uh, that might, you know, buy their ticket very late in the, uh, in, in the booking curve. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you hope uh, that you, you, know, you, you made the right decision to say no to a bunch of other opportunities in order to have the right amount of space left. Uh, what we wanted to make sure is that we were assigning the right value to foregone opportunities to release uh, inventory at, at, uh, at reward levels. Okay, because there actually is a real revenue recognition benefit to having those points redeemed. So putting that math, putting that calculus into the reporting and making sure that foregone opportunities to actually get liability off of the books are actually recognized as part of our overall revenue management team and their daily work uh, was an important step for us. Uh, but you know, that is an example of how we will you know, through our you know, through our daily operations, uh, make sure that we're that, that we're all holding hands around the right set of measures. We I, I will say we have a dramatically different settlement model than what most carriers have, which I, I mean I guess is the benefit of having the space and the time and the technology to deliver something completely different. Um, as Scott alluded to, I mean we have tests going on, let's say I can think of three that we have going on right now between the currency management team and the revenue management team to kind of optimize the program overall. I will say, to be transparent, I think one thing that is going to be difficult for us as we come out of the pandemic, we've been living in an environment where it's been very easy to get access to seats. Um, I think the conversations are probably going to become a little bit more difficult in the months ahead. Nevertheless, I still think that we're starting with a much better foundation that uh, you know is is light years apart from where Aeroplan and Air Canada were even you know even pre-acquisition or sorry pre uh, pre spin out um, from a settlement compensation model perspective. I just, yeah, it's, uh, your question is interesting because I listened to your comment this morning too and, and I, there's no question that one of the reasons that the difficulty existed with AMIA was, at least this is from my perspective, pre-joining, watching it, they didn't manage the inventory properly even though travel grew, even though their membership grew, it was not good and Air Canada took the reputation hit. As we all entered into the acquisition of Aeroplan, we got that very quickly and it had to be fixed. There are agreements, and interesting, the two things I would say from a legal perspective that drive the agreements that need to be there, one is tax. You could even start before that if you wanted to with regulatory, and that is that from a regulatory perspective, certain aspects of us are not carriers and don't have the appropriate licenses. So that's very big. The regulatory people in Air Canada are very strict with us on what we as an aeroplan can promise. Secondly, um, the other thing that happens is tax, which drives a lot of it. Um, you were commenting earlier, we watched with great interest what the U.S. carriers did uh, through the pandemic in terms of trying of, of uh, monetizing their loyalty programs. Um, I think we can say it because we're hoping we come, we're coming through the other side of this. That was the antithesis of what I think we wanted, honestly. And it'll be interesting to watch as recovery goes on if they unwind those. Because depending on what you want to do, it, I would look at it and say it is the antithesis. That's my point of view. But we looked at those very carefully, and if we had to do it, it really wasn't what we wanted. I, I will say, I read. I think like many of us, I read some of those documents, and it was just like, Oof. You, you should have called us. We'll, we'll, tell you, we'll tell you the pain points of what you've just signed up for. Yeah, uh, volunteering for additional constraints, um, if it's unnecessary, isn't something you, you, you wish for voluntarily. So. Um, uh, and, and I think in fairness, I mean, they've sort of already made noises that they'd be looking to unwind at least partially, you know, as soon as they can. So um, uh, time for, I've got a, another question or two, but uh, Matt, you had your hand up. Uh, just, just curious thoughts about uh, Carl joining Westjet and what that will do to the loyalty landscape uh, in your market. Because obviously he brings in, yeah. in, in you know, a very... His perspective of what the I, think, should do. I think what Matt's asking is, does this mean it's game on? So, so for, for those of you who aren't aware, WestJet, who's our principal domestic competitor, recently hired the former CEO of Virgin Australia's uh, partially spun out at the time, at least, loyalty program um, to be uh, the head of loyalty uh, over there. Um, look, I love competition. In fact, the worst thing that can happen in a marketplace is where there isn't really good competition um, because quite candidly, that's how inefficiencies um, and uh, you know, uh, state ideas um, stick around or inefficiencies get introduced and state ideas stick around. 
Um, and so I think it's actually the best possible thing for us to have a stronger competitor in that regard. Um, and we certainly anticipate that Carl and his team will do just that, especially compared to kind of what's um, there now. Um, uh, and then, you know, in general, the other way to look at it is WestJet's a big competitor in domestic Canada, but actually uh, over two thirds of Air Canada's revenue is not domestic Canada. Um, and uh, uh, Canada is, um, we go back and forth of Australia as having the most foreign capacity relative to demand of any country in the world. So our competitors are Delta, American, uh, Air France KLM, Cathay Pacific, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, no uh, shortage of competition in that regard. And some of the strongest bank proprietary programs in the world relative to interchange are the Canadian bank proprietary programs. Um, so this is just another uh, lens or element on competition, but uh, bring it on. I, I, I'll add just one thing. I echo everything Mark said, but also I said this to someone earlier. I think I said it to you earlier in the day, which is great that they're going to have that strategy, but I think about what we've been through over the course of the past five years. You need a lot of smart people sitting in your organization to deliver a transformation of that size. So I, I think it's a great starting point, but you know, to, to build the right team with the right competencies. They certainly have a couple of ex Air Canada people over there. Um, so to Mark's point, bring it on. We welcome the competition. And uh, you know, uh, when, when, when Carl, you know, when Carl took the reins of, uh, of Velocity, which is Virgin Australia's uh, former program, well, you know, when in its former incarnation, um, you know the way he made the assessment was very clear. I mean, Qantas had got cocky. Um, and, you know, uh, we're big believers in the three-way win. You know, uh, what's a, a strategy that delivers a win for the program, for the airline, and for the customer is an optimal strategy. Uh, and Qantas had got cocky once ANSET had, had disappeared. Um, and partners were feeling screwed over. Members were feeling screwed over. I mean, the opportunity was there. So I think that if Carl had come in a little while ago, uh, perhaps the landscape would have been more ripe for opportunity for him, but uh, I think he, uh, as you say, competition is healthy, uh, and I think he has a very competitive aeroplane to go up against, at least in terms of the, the domestic market approach. We're, we're coming to time, so one final question, and I really want to sort of bring it back to the, the first panel um, this morning, Mark. You know, it, it got brought up the, the topic of uh, award charts you know, and the importance of members having a goal to aim for. Uh, and I know that you guys agonized over this and a lot of time and energy, um, you know, we've talked about it before, in terms of how you approach that uh, to maintain flexibility, but also still maintaining that people had a goal to, to, to shoot for. So as sort of the final, the final question uh, to you guys, again, now that we're 12 months on, um, your feelings on that and how you see that has played out. Sure. So. Um we feel good about the decision we made, which was essentially we bifurcated between, you know, more or less the everyday redemptions, um, you know, particularly within North America, and the more aspirational redemptions, particularly premium cabin, partner, long haul. Um, and, you know, I mean, like the reality was we didn't really see the value. I mean, there's a certain economic model that exists with partner redemptions. And that economic model doesn't require the kind of variability uh, which offering every single seat on our own flights requires. Um, and so we saw uh, in it um, a lot of uh, potential disadvantage um, for limited upside, given that we can just change the chart itself, which we did as we brought together the program, in which we will continue to change the chart over time. Um, you know, maybe one, one, one final thought for me on it as well. So much of this, right, is perception and feelings. What are the emotions that are going to be invoked um, from the communications and from the change in programs? And people really do, even people who are not really engaged, like in a super, you know, point sound kind of sense, um, they still feel that they have value on the table and they still feel that they are owed something um, for all of the you know, activities that they undertook in order to get the accrual. And from a broader brand play, um, you know, we, we don't want to, I mean, put it very, very simply, we want to make sure that we leave a good taste in the mouths of our members. Um, and we viewed this as uh, one of the key ways in which to do it with the uh, transformation of Aeroplan. Nothing to add? Okay. Yeah. So, trust is important, you know, and, and devaluation to, if, again, I'm putting words in your mouth from this morning, but the evaluations break trust and that impacts your ability to have that continued engagement with the member. Would that be a fair comment? 
Yeah, and we need to earn, like what, what we need to do is we need to have time to prove that the variable or dynamic model that we have, how it works and how it delivers value, um, and um, you know, I mean, uh, there's a there's a state, uh, Missouri, uh, you know, show me state, I believe is what they what they say about themselves, and that applies in this case, uh, which is we need to demonstrate a bunch of the commitments that we made to members when we did the transformation about flexibility, um, about transparency, about predictability, and then maybe after that, that gives us more license. I'm not saying we're going to change this part of award charts, but in other parts of the program, but like you know, let's put up and then. Uh, you know, at some point in time, hopefully we'll have the credibility and the flexibility to do more. Terrific. Look, we are at time, and I know the guys have to run. Thank you so much uh, for joining us, um, Steve and Derek, Scott and Mark. Uh, Mark, thanks for joining us twice. I know you literally flew in the door this morning uh, to make that first panel. So um, thanks for joining us. It's been great. All the conversations we've had uh, over the period of time um, in seeing how aeroplanes develop. Obviously, the credit card launch today, very exciting. Uh, I know that there's more in the pipeline, so uh, we're all looking forward uh, to that. And obviously, of course, you're always welcome back at the Lordy Summit. So uh, let's put it together for, uh, for Team Canada. Thank you.